now our chalice will be lit by Eloise Carroll and friends. Give it up for Eloise Carroll and friends. Our opening words are adapted from the writings of the poet Anne Sexton, her poem, Small Wire. My faith is a great weight hung on a small wire, as doth the spider hang her baby on a thin web, as doth the vine, twiggy and wooden, hold up grapes like eyeballs, as many angels dance on the head of a pin. God does not need too much wire to keep her there. Just a thin vein with blood pushing back and forth in it and some love. As it has been said, love and a cough cannot be concealed. <laughs> Even a small cough even a small love. So if you have only a thin wire, God does not mind. She will enter your hands as easily as 10 cents used to bring forth a Coke. <laughs> Remember that? God of grace and God of glory, as we welcome Tom Einstein, we will sing number 115.
and we join in the words of our unison affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ley. Este es nuestro gran pacto, vivir juntos en paz, buscar la verdad en el amor, y ayudarnos los unos a los otros. And before you sit down, turn and introduce yourself to someone you may not know. And what the heck, everybody? Why don't we all sing happy birthday to Corinne Dowd? Take a bow. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Corinne. Happy birthday to you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You who are here for the very first time, welcome to you who have been here always. If you are new and want to stay in touch with this congregation, there are blue connection cards in the pews, and that's a way of us learning a little bit about you and you learning a little bit more about us. This is a Unitarian Universalist congregation where our historical affirmations are ones of freedom, freedom of belief, freedom of unbelief, reason. One does not need to check one's brains at the door when you come here. And tolerance, though another way of saying tolerance is a radical openness to people other than ourselves. We grow not by living in an echo chamber, but by encountering people different from ourselves. Freedom and reason and openness to others are our principal affirmations. Welcome. There are announcements in the order of service, which I urge you to pay attention to. There is a congregational meeting following uh, this service at what uh, time? 11.45, is that correct? 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock noon, there will be a congregational meeting, and that is for the purpose of authorizing the funding of solar panels for this old meeting house. And I also want you to know that this week we are turning in our membership numbers to the Unitarian Universalist Association. And yet again, I am flogging our membership book for anyone who might be persuaded to consider themselves a member of this outfit. You know, this isn't like, who was it who used to say, I wouldn't join an organization that would have the likes of me to be its members. Who said that? Groucho Marx, exactly right. Well, if you're willing to put your name in this book, we would be honored, and indeed, we're strengthened by your presence. So speak to me afterwards if you're interested in membership or have questions. And I've pretty much said as much as I need to say, and I think it's time for Annie to go to work. Good morning. Good morning. 
Well, this morning I have a challenge. And since this is a time for all ages, this is a challenge open to anyone of any age. I have a basket and some small objects that one could toss. And I want to see, can anyone stand down here and toss an object into the basket? If you can, I have some prizes. Don't get too excited. They're pretty like low-key prizes, but, but get a little excited. Get a little bit excited. Yeah, come on up. All right, see if you can do it. Oh, it's hard. All right, give it a try. Give it a try. Oh, good try, good try, good try. Try again. Oh, man, it's hard. Can somebody else try? You try, you try. Man, this, this is pretty hard. This is a pretty hard task. I think it might be really hard to win the prize if you have to actually get the object in the basket. So I have another thought. I have another thought. What if all you have to do is try to get it in the basket to win a prize? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how that goes. You want to try? That was very good. You tried. Here, take a prize. There's dogs and dinosaurs. Yeah, you got dogs. That's awesome. All right, how about you give it a try? You tried. Go for it. All right, I'm going to let people who want to keep trying and taking prizes continue to do that. You have to try and get your prize. Great. And can I get a redistributor of thrown objects? Thank you, Brad. Um, great. What happened to the heart? Did we lose our heart already? That's a bad thing to lose at church. It's bad when you lose your heart. Anybody have the red heart? <laughs> All right. So, so I have a question. Does anybody know what this game has to do with grace? Well, here's what I think. When the only people who can get the prize are the ones who can actually do the thing and succeed at the task, that can be really, really tricky. Now, that's how some things work, of course. That's how, like, winning a sports competition works. And for games like this, it's fine for it to work that way if you're at a carnival or whatever. But if the task is something a lot bigger than an activity, if the task is like trying to be a good person, then it has to work a little differently. It's really, really hard to live up to our values all the time. It's really hard. It's about as hard as getting one of these objects into one of these baskets, I would say. And the wonderful thing, the very, very good news of Unitarian Universalism is that we are loved as we are as long as we try. As long as we're trying to live up to our values, we still get a prize, and the prize is being beloved. And that's a beautiful prize, much more exciting than temporary tattoos. <laughs> Somebody did it! Dylan, you have earned your belovedness while all the rest of us just must exist by grace. <laughs> um, so sometimes you succeed, right? But good thing there's grace, because a lot of people did not succeed. Um, I think it's a really, really important thing about our faith that we, we do not have to be perfect and that we are loved all the time. And there is a poem that is on my mind um, that I want to close out with that is about that. And it's by um, a poet that died recently that maybe has been on many of our minds, Mary Oliver. And so I'm going to close out as we continue to make our good faith attempts and get our good prizes. Um, with uh, the poem, The Wild Geese, that kind of sums it up for me. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, 
over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. And some of us find our place in the achievers of the task. We in, now invite everyone who is heading to Sunday school to head to Sunday school. If you are a kid who has not gotten your prize, you can go ahead and get it on your way out. And we will move on with our service. There is more love somewhere. Our hymn is number 95. sneaking your reading in. This is a reading on grace by Frederick Buechner. After centuries of handling and mishandling, most religious words have become so shop-worn, nobody's much interested anymore. Not so with grace, for some reason. Mysteriously, even derivatives like gracious and graceful 
still have some bloom left. Grace is something you can never get but can only be given. There's no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. Have you ever tried to love somebody? A crucial eccentricity of the Christian faith is the assertion that people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. The grace of God means something like, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are. Because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. And nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. There's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace the gift of grace can be yours only if you'll reach out and take it. Maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift too. The Lebanese-American poet and writer Khalil Gibran once said, you say, I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in your orchard and the sheep in your flock say no. They give so that they may live. We give so that we may live. Freely we have received. Freely give for the good works of this congregation within and far, far beyond these walls. Our offering will gratefully be received.
It's funny what you find when you look inside pulpits. Do you ever go to another church and look in a pulpit and see what stuff may happen to be in there? Here is the trigger from a handgun. On Bedford Day, we had a blacksmith come, and we had that blacksmith beat guns into garden tools. And this is one piece of debris. If you ever need a piece of gun debris, you'll know where to find it. <laughs> so perhaps you'll recall that my sermon this morning is a continuation of a sermon I preached three weeks ago with the unlikely title, Paradoxical Interventions, with reference to Reverend Billy Sanctuary and Charlie Chaplin's 1928 silent film, The Circus. Now, if you don't know about that sermon, it actually is printed up and available in our literature rack in the entryway. Tonight, I go to Sudbury, where I will join the 117th annual retreat of the Freighters of the Wayside Inn, a convocation of mad Unitarian Universalist monks. <laughs> we have our rituals, some of which I've described to you, and we will present papers assigned to us by the prior, the head mad monk, who this year is the Reverend Hank Purse from Reading. The prior tells us, he assigns us the topics of our papers. And this is how he instructed me. I would like you to write about Reverend Billy's idea of sanctuary and sharing sanctuary as a church, then expanding it to the whole world a la universal sanctuary. As I have noted previously, this assignment makes pretty much no sense to me whatsoever. I feel like I am being asked to juggle a few balls and pins, some flaming torches, some spinning plates, and then I'm tossed a kitten and a <laughs> whizzing chainsaw. In other words, I am not to blame for this mess. Hank Purse. Reverend Hank 1, R-E-V-H-A-N-K, numeral 1, at gmail.com. <laughs> the only commonality I can imagine, the only unifying thread that brings together these disparate topics together, is that each is unexpected, improbable, and counterintuitive. I'm not going to remind you at length of the antics of Reverend Billy and his merry band of stop shopping activist gospel pranksters who have visited us three times. He is an improbable kind of ear and eye popping astonishment to causes of social and environmental justice and he goes around shouting, change a earth a That we would provide physical sanctuary to an undocumented woman, room and board and a legal defense, and an army of volunteers to defy tyranny and empire. Well, that's an unusual and improbable thing for any church to do. In my last sermon, I used Charlie Chaplin's film, The Circus, as yet another way of illustrating the power of the improbable. The little tramp bumbles into a dispirited circus ruled by a tyrannical ringmaster, and by his ridiculous, unselfconscious antics, he liberates the oppressed. 
In a dark time, laughter liberates. The poet Anne Sexton described her faith as a great weight hung on a small wire. And thus, the theme I'm trying to distill is that sometimes a very nearly invisible homeopathic distillate and tincture of health and healing and wholeness can reverberate with a power and glory that far exceeds its perceived earthly value. Thou canst not stir a flower without disturbing a star. Thou canst not stir a flower without disturbing a star. So wrote Francis Thompson. So where I'm going with all of this is where Hank, Reverend Hank one at gmail.com, <laughs> asked me to go to expand this to the whole world a la Universal Sanctuary. I believe that Unitarian Universalism is a potent and even explosive distillation, tincture, and titration of the unexpected, such that not only may we topple oppressive systems by the subversive interjection of the unexpected, but that this faith may also revivify and breathe life into the dead bones that all too often are our own dead bones. My friends, the freighters, are an especially universalist group. And the common thread I'm trying to find, the thin wire upon which we may hang the great weight of faith, is, I think, more allied with universalism than with Unitarianism. This is a gross oversimplification, but indeed Unitarians are a heady and rather rational bunch. We believe in one God at most, <laughs> etc. The Universalists are much more heart-centered and a bit more non-rational, less bound by the strictures of reason. The Universalists say, all may be saved. Universal salvation. All may be saved. All may grow into harmony with the divine. You know, this is an unexpected and improbable gospel. We live in a culture of, you get what you deserve. You reap what you sow. One of the hardest parts of preaching is reading my handwritten notes. <laughs> we live in a culture of scarcity. Historically and today, universalism is a balm to those who are oppressed by hellfire and brimstone religion oppressed by the judgments of others and the judgments we place upon ourselves. Universalism says the blessings of life are actually boundless and infinite. Grace abounds. I will be coming back to grace. Somewhere I found an old 19th century evangelical Christian tract that denounces universalism. It's called Reasons for Not Embracing the Doctrine of Universal Salvation. The greater part of the community who are believers in divine revelation and persons of industrious and virtuous habits, though not professedly pious, will reject the doctrine and avoid the preaching that attempts to propagate it. But if there are in the community any deists 
who have opposed Christianity until their opposition has become unpopular, these, when the trumpet of universalism is blown, will be among the first professed converts to the faith. That being screened from odium by the name of Christian, they may still aim their poisoned shafts against the cause of evangelical truth. This tract goes on. The profane swearers in a town or city, together with those who are accustomed to neglect public worship, I see some of those people right here now. <laughs> they who violate the Sabbath by business or amusements will become diligent in their attendance upon the worship which is conducted by preachers of universal salvation. If there are any persons in the community who are unfaithful in the conjugal relation, and who are accustomed to drink stolen waters as sweeter than their own, these are usually much pleased to hear that there is no hell and that adulterers shall inherit the kingdom of God. I have noticed also that intemperate persons are generally very ready to attend when the doctrine of universal salvation is preached near them and hear with much satisfaction that the path of the drunkard leads as directly to heaven as the path of the just. Another portion of the audience of a universalist preacher is commonly made up of young men and boys of loose habits. Those whose feet, according to the Bible, go down to death and whose steps take hold on hell delight to hear it proved that the Bible lies and that fornicators shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those persons who have been awakened to a sense of their guilt and danger and have as often relapsed into a stupid or irreligious state and who are always annoyed and irritated by the doctrines of grace are much inclined to seek rest under the preaching of universalists and there get their consciences quieted by hearing that there is no day of judgment and no punishment for the wicked. Well, all you deists, you bearers of unpopular opinions, you profane swearers, you who neglect public worship, you who are unfaithful, adulterous, intemperate, ye of loose habits and fornicators, you who sometimes live with a sense of guilt and danger and stupidity, the irreligious, the annoyed and irritated, that covers about all of you, doesn't it? <laughs> Universalism says that none of us and no one else and no one anywhere is banished from grace and possibility. Reverend Billy proclaims, earth alluia. Earth is our sacred sanctuary. Those who rise in defense of the scorned and undocumented, those who keep faith with the fallen, these are all acts of mercy and grace. Now, it probably won't surprise any of you to know that I tend not to rely on a whole lot of theological language. My religion is pretty darn this worldly. What I know of revelation is revealed in the here and now and in the ordinary. One, not, one need not seek the supernatural, for as George Orwell once said, to see what is in front of our nose is a constant struggle. And so, it may come to you as a surprise, and indeed it comes to me as a surprise, that the common thread, the thin wire that I am looking for that connects not only Reverend Billy and Sanctuary and Charlie Chaplin and Universalism is a theological word, and that is the word 
grace. I don't talk much about grace, but I know it to be real. So here goes. The essence of grace, as indeed Annie explained, is that it is unexpected and improbable. Grace seems to go against every human instinct. We are naturally drawn to cause and effect, to covenants, to karma, to reaping what we sow, to getting what we deserve, to earning what we receive. Grace is different. Grace is an unmerited favor given alike to the deserving and the undeserving. It was my mentor in ministry, Gordon McKeeman, also a freighter, by the way, who was fond of quoting Khalil Gibran as I did. You say I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in your orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pasture. They give that they may live. Grace is hard to understand because it is not entirely rational. Bono, the lead singer of U2, says, grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions. I love the image of the kind confessor on the front of your order of service. This etching is framed in my office. Can you see what's going on in this scene in the monastery? There is a very scrunched up, negative looking, angry sort of guy on the right in one confessional. And then there is kind of a roly-poly happy-go-lucky monk on the other side. And where do the people go? The people go where they will receive a blessing, where they may make their confession and be forgiven. That is a universalist image. Ours is an abundant faith, not a stingy one. Grace and blessing and forgiveness are available to all of us if we are willing to receive it. Saints and sinners. You know, there's a great church in Colorado that is called the House for All Saints and Sinners. H-F-A-S-S. It is one grace-filled, half-assed church. And I would wish that we be similarly infamous, saints and sinners. This is the radical equality at the heart of universalism. None, none shall be cast into outer darkness. A writer named Peter Wenner has said, if you find yourself in the company of people whose hearts have been captured by grace, count yourselves lucky. They love us despite our messy lives. Stay connected to us through our struggles, always holding out the hope of redemption. When relationships are broken, it's grace that causes people not to give up, to extend the invitation to reconnect to work through misunderstandings with sensitivity and transparency. You don't sense hard edges, dogmatism, or self-righteous judgment from gracious people. There's a tenderness about them that opens doors that had previously been bolted shut. People who have been transformed by grace have a special place in their hearts for those living in the shadows of society. They're easily moved by stories of suffering and step into the breach to heal. And grace, properly understood, always produces gratitude. Of course, the idea of grace can be misused by those who do not want to be held accountable for their actions. Later this winter, we will 
welcome a one-man performance by a man who reenacts Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran martyr executed by the Nazis who coined the term cheap grace. Cheap grace is that of people who do not wish to be held accountable for their actions. And really, it is challenging to balance justice and grace. But the biggest problem we have today is not that there is too much grace, but that grace is too often absent from our public and personal lives. Grace is often said to be a gift of God, God's grace. And if those terms work for you, great. But I don't really think it matters much what you believe or disbelieve. Grace abides as some combination of generosity and magnanimity, kindness and forgiveness and empathy, all above the ordinary call of duty and bestowed even or especially when not particularly earned. Well, I am pretty much done with this juggling act. That which unifies Reverend Billy and Sanctuary and Charlie Chaplin and Universalism, the kitten and the chainsaw, <laughs> is that small, unexpected, and improbable but empire-shattering, soul-rearranging tincture called grace. My mentor, Frater McKeeman, used to say two other things. Approvingly, he periodically quoted Emerson, who would appeal to his parishioners saying, there are sermons foolishly spoken that may be wisely heard. <laughs> I appeal to your wise hearing. Reverend Hank won at <laughs> gmail.com. And McKeeman further said words that we may imagine being spoken by the kind confessor. Blessings. Manifold, diverse, and plentiful. Blessings. Manifold, diverse, and plentiful. Call and respond. Blessings. Blessings. Manifold, Manifold. Diverse. diverse. Plentiful. plentiful. Put it together. Blessings, manifold, diverse, and plentiful. Oh, so plentiful. Amen. Saints and sinners, let's sing. You can't preach this sermon without singing Amazing Grace. And there's some nonsense in our hymnal about whether you should say the word wretch or say the word soul. Believe me, we're all wretches. I mean, we're wretches. Just give it up. 205, Amazing Grace.
closing words, Mary Oliver's poem, Who Said This? Something whispered something that was not even a word. It was more like a silence that was understandable. I was standing at the edge of the pond. Nothing living, what we call living, was in sight. And yet, the voice entered me, my body life, with so much happiness, and there was nothing there but the water, the sky, the grass. Amen.